In our uh, course site, I have under course materials, let's see, module eight, uh, there should be the, the manual on uniform traffic control devices that has been mentioned in that presentation before, and I have it in my presentation also. It's a, it's a pretty large uh, document but it has all the uh, regulations relative to, uh, <coughs> uh, to to the use of signals, barricades, and, and, and traffic control devices that can be used in, uh, on a job site. So I recommend that you uh, take a quick look at that uh, later on. Okay, so we want to identify uh, these type of hazards and how to prevent them from happening on the, on the job site. <coughs> the definition, as we saw before, depending on what is the, the source of the injury, if, it, if you've been hit, and that uh, action is what caused the, the injury that you're uh, struck by. If you're between two surfaces or two equipment, then that's a cut in or between. Hard hats, it's a, an important protection from uh, falling objects uh, on your head. You want to have good uh, hard hats that can protect you from injuries. There are different types. Uh, you have type one, type two, uh, some of those. And so type, type one basically is the protection from overhead. Type two gives you some protection from the side. Prices can vary you know, from few dollars to uh, 100, I guess, depending on what type of uh, hard hat you, you're using. Uh, they're generally not that expensive and, and they're plastic, so they, they can protect you also from uh, electrical shocks. Some of those are uh, class E, class G, provide limited protection, electrical protection. Some uh, are good for very high voltages, so depending on what type of work you're going to use, you have to select the proper hard hat. Some of those are, are actually conductive, they're made of uh, aluminum, so they're not intended to protect you against uh, contact with uh, electricity, but they look good. So some people you know, buy them because they, they, they kind of look nice, but not really protecting yourself. So you have to be careful when you choose this uh, type of protection, because you know it, it, it's your head that's being protected uh, from from injuries. You do want to look into your hard hat and see if it has this uh, marking. It's normally uh, a marking that they put on the hard hats, meaning that that hard hat will uh, meet the specifications contained in this um, uh, ANSI uh, standard. So that means it has at least the minimum protection uh, that you require for your head. Inspect it, make sure that it doesn't have any cracks, that it's not uh, you know, uh, damaged, that will protect you, that it has a good uh, um, support system. Um, there is also struck by fatalities that can occur when, when you're hit by something, uh, you know, unintentionally. Here is a person who was driving down the street and got hit by a, a nail and a shot from a construction site. So it's, it has some pictures over there that are a little disgusting, so I hope that you're not too, too sensitive to those. Actually, it's a police officer, and it's strange that he got shot. I looked over here and saw that what used to be concrete pads was now framed up houses, and as I drove by this house right here on the end, it was in the number one lane, and bam. Hey, this is Officer Harris. I just got hit by a nail at a construction site. I'm on the nails at Palmer Road. I need an ambulance now. You got hit by a nail, you said? The only description that I can give is that I'd never wish that it would happen to anybody ever again. Um, it was so um, blunt. It was okay. so sudden. So are you injured? Yes, I'm injured. I got a freaking shot to the head. My left pupil 
will always be larger than my right pupil. The pupil doesn't react in a normal fashion. Everything becomes a little bit uh, hazy um, just due to the oversaturation of light. <clears throat> that someday he may be shot because um, this day and age that kind of stuff happens all the time so I did say that before he left the house I said now I worry that somebody might follow you and shoot you it's just a kind of a freak thing you don't even really know how to explain it to anybody when you say what happened because it's not like this happens very often little did Jennifer Harris know the numbers tell a different story in 2003 the Consumer Product Safety Commission privately estimated that more than 500 bystanders every year are hurt by stray nail gun blasts, including women and children. I can't be scared and run away from a situation, but, you know, it's, it's just that one extra thing in life that you now got to be aware of, that you think that it's not going to happen to me, you know. It's just I'm just driving down the street, just coming home from the gym. Yes, uh, see, we, we have a duty to protect also people who are outside of the uh, job site. You know, a, a nail can end up at a uh, long distance, so that's why it's important to be trained in the use, the correct use and operation of these power tools. Uh, drug buys can also happen uh, on, on, on the road, so you need to have good visibility codes, personal protective equipment, you know. Be aware of your surroundings. Uh, you can have uh, trains that tip over, fall on top of you, that also can cause uh, death or serious injury. Uh, with loads, it's, it's very important that you never ever put yourself under the load. Uh, you know, that load can fail at any time. The bring a support system, the load, can, uh, the load can, can move and hit you, so you have to really be aware of your surroundings. You know, here's a case where uh, obviously the big truck does not see that person down there and uh, boom. And, and these kind of accidents, you know, they happen uh, on the street also, especially motorcycles, you know, people don't see motorcycles and that that's a, a problem. So on the job site, you know, you, you, you're doing some work and you're exposed to cars that are driving by at high speed, so you need to take precautions and do some uh, control. Don't place yourself in a position where you can be a crush, you know, always. Uh, I have to believe that that was only for the picture, because uh, they you know, not know what can put themselves into that situation where they're, uh, you know, make sure that the equipment is also in a safe position before you leave it. You know, don't leave the uh, vehicle unattended. Did we see this video before, the forklift? No? I'm Barb Deshane, investigating officer with WorkSafe BC. A worker at this veneer and lumber plant died when he was crushed by a forklift. This is what happened. Stacks of veneer had built up near the planer, so some of it needed to be moved to the long-term storage yard. Using a loader that had been converted to a forklift, a worker started to move the stacks to the storage yard. It was dark, so he may not have noticed that the frozen ground there sloped both forward and sideways. The forklift was carrying four stacks of veneer. The load was 10 feet high and weighed more than 14,000 pounds. This was at least 1,500 pounds more than the forklift's rated capacity. When the worker was nearly ready to unload the four stacks, he stopped the machine, put the transmission in neutral, and set the parking brake. With the load still raised, he exited the cab. He then went in front of the raised load, probably to place dunnage on the ground to support the veneer stacks. The forklift moved forward down the slope, crushing the worker between the raised load and the stacks of veneer on the ground. This accident could have been prevented. Do not exceed the rated capacity. Overloading affects the forklift's stability and center of gravity. This forklift was so heavily overloaded that its rear wheels were not making full contact with the ground. Don't rely on just the parking brake. This forklift's parking brake worked properly but could not hold the forklift in place. The four-wheel drive forklift had a drive shaft disc type parking brake. 
This type of parking or emergency brake is found on various types of mobile equipment. Unlike the parking brake on most cars, a drive shaft disc type brake doesn't act directly on the wheel, <coughs> but instead stops the drive shaft from rotating. With this type of system, the wheels are not locked. A non-lock differential allows the wheels to rotate in opposite directions, even with the parking brake applied. Normally, when the parking brake is applied, the front and rear wheels counteract each other, so the forklift stays in place. For this to work, all four wheels need to be on the ground and have good traction. But here, the grade and excessive load caused the forklift to tilt forward so much that the rear wheels were likely off the ground and had no traction. With the front wheels able to rotate and the back wheels unable to counteract them, the forklift rolled forward, pivoting and sliding down the slope. Lower the forks to the ground before exiting the cab. Lowering the forks helps to ensure that a forklift doesn't move. Stay out of hazard areas, like the crush zone in front of a forklift. If you operate a forklift, keep within its raid capacity. And don't rely on just the parking brake. Lower the forks and keep out of the crush zone. It may save your <coughs> life. And it doesn't take too much time <coughs> just to lower the thing, put it in a safe uh, state, and then uh, go ahead and do your business. Okay. You have, uh, you know, equipment that may roll over in different uh, <coughs> conditions. Uh, I was hearing that in, we're having a big issue with uh, people that work on lawnmowers and, and go near the water, it takes over and people get drowned. So that's another uh, hot sort of uh, operation. Always use your, your seat belt, you know, don't uh, use the equipment in an unintended uh, way. Be aware of what's going around you all the time. Wear high visible clothes to prevent being uh, struck on a, a site. And it, it comes down to be aware of your surroundings. You know, make sure that you know what what's going on around and prevent yourself from being uh, in a position where you can get hurt. Here, this is an example of uh, pre-planning that uh, you know you, people sometimes fail to plan ahead and get uh, to know what is required to do a job, and and then uh, accidents happen. I'm currently an investigating officer with WorkSafe BC. Before you start a job, make sure a hazard assessment and a job plan have been done. That didn't happen at this well site. Instead, the workers improvised things went terribly wrong. A truck driver arrived with a load of concrete barriers. He'd been told that there would be a picker truck for offloading, but there wasn't one. Instead, just before the truck arrived, an excavator operator on the site was directed by his supervisor to offload <coughs> using this excavator. With no proper lifting attachment on site, the two workers improvised with what was on hand. The truck driver had some tie-down chains, so he rigged them above the excavator bucket and around the two grooves beneath the barrier. When the excavator lifted the barrier, one chain slipped out of its groove. The truck driver waved to the excavator operator to stop and to lower the load so he could reposition the chains. The operator couldn't hear what the driver was saying, so with the load suspended, he engaged the safety lockout lever. This disabled the operating controls, preventing the excavator and boom from moving. He then exited his cab and talked to the driver. As the operator climbed back into the excavator, his pant leg snagged the safety lockout lever, releasing it. This enabled the controls. His left pocket then snagged a joystick. The excavator's boom suddenly swung. The barrier glanced off the driver's chest, dipped down, and then struck his lower leg, knocking him off the flat deck. The barrier then slipped from the chains and crashed onto the flat deck. This accident didn't have to happen. Safety activities must be coordinated on multiple employer work sites. Here, the work among the different employers was not coordinated. The pre-job planning was inadequate. Employers must perform a risk assessment, identify hazards, and implement safe work procedures. Don't start a job until the proper equipment and procedures are in place. The supervision was also inadequate. 
supervisors must inform workers of hazards and regularly check that workers are doing their jobs safely. Although an excavator can be used to lift barriers, a picker truck or forklift provides better control. With a picker truck or excavator, use an engineered lifting device. Most precast concrete suppliers have specialized barrier lifts available for loan. Never leave the controls of lifting equipment while a load is suspended and keep a safe distance from the load. The driver's leg was fractured so badly that part of it had to be amputated. Don't improvise. Plan ahead and stay safe. That's uh, another example. You know, planning makes a big difference and using the correct tools Use the right tool for the job, right? In uh, maintenance operations, you also want to, you know, follow proper procedure, dock the equipment in such way that your life does not depend on a small hydraulic valve. Check the tools and equipment that you're using to make sure that they're in good operating condition. Uh, when storing material, you also need to uh, make sure that they are uh, properly stacked that they're not going to uh, fall on top of people. This operation, you know, when, when, when you have uh, pipes or, or rebar coming from a truck and then you have to unload them, use the right tools and equipment. And uh, I was in a job site in Venezuela where we received a huge truck full of rebar and the unloading procedure was uh, the guy would come here or something, and then all those rebar will bam, 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 fall down to the floor. So you know, it's a really dangerous operation, and uh, it, it, it was clearly not planned ahead. That's how that's how it's done. I see I see rebar being offered like that almost every job site. Very rarely do you see a forklift take rebar off. It's normally just dumped. Yeah. Trusses have a little. The they roll right off the back of the. Oh, yeah, with trusses or they roll right off the back. They have like a special trailer. Yeah, it's, they have a low boy with rollers. With rollers, rolls right off. Mm -hmm. yeah. So you have to, you know, be be aware of what's going on. Nails, you know, we, we saw already a video with the nail nail going uh, shooting you know, an officer in the street. Uh, this is a typical case where you know the person is operating a a. Uh, nail gun and then somebody's behind. Uh, it could be, you know, farther behind and then it just misses that, uh, the start and, and, and hits somebody. So that, that's uh, very dangerous. Then this is a powder actuated one where you have the cartridges in this uh, plastic uh, container and so at times you shoot, it, it um, explodes that little cartridge and shoots the nail out. It's a different type from the uh, air operating one. So to maintain a uh, incident free site, plan ahead, provide training to your employees, do inspection every now and then, make sure that the conditions have not changed, learn from your uh, accidents or near misses and reevaluate all the time. You know, a, a job site is a busy place. You have things going on all over the place. You need to be aware of your surroundings at all times to prevent uh, accidents. When you're doing excavation, you know, extra care has to be taken off. We, we talked about uh, shielding the, uh, the, the site to prevent gate in. And, you know, there's always things going in and out. You, you need to protect your employees from, from these hazards. When, when you are uh, in a trench and the trench uh, collapse, uh, the amount of weight uh, of soil that is going to uh, fall on top of that person is really significant. So that, that will make the uh, extraction a difficult job. So you, you need to really protect uh, employers from cave-ins uh, that can occur. You need to have a plan uh, in, to, to, in effect to rescue people use uh, shield boxes to prevent uh, cave-ins or have uh, the proper sloping on the sides. You also need to maintain a clearance around that uh, uh, opening and you know, 
set up your barricades to protect, prevent people from falling inside those holes. It's easy to hit one of the underground utilities, so you, you need to call ahead, make sure that uh, you know where things are before digging. Uh, extra, yeah. Is there any requirement that you're making a, a trench that of wide it's supposed to be to provide workers to be inside of it? Inside of it? No. no. There's no width because if you if you're going to put a 36 inch pipe, you're just going to have enough room. What it takes the width of the trench many times is it's the pipe and the area around it that you have to backfill and how you're going to backfill it. So it's not really, that's why you have to either use uh, uh, shoring and things like that. So, so let's say that you're using, you need five feet. You don't have any additional width on each side that yes, you need you to do. provide? You have, you do have, but it's not so much that I know of for the safety of the a person or the uh, pipe. So basically what they take to uh, the width, width is the is actual design and the uh, criteria of implementing the design. Like if you're putting in a 36 inch pipe, you gotta put a foot of ballast on each side. Right. So you're gonna have to go at least six foot to right. kind of have some kind of workability within the trench. Right. It depends on certain factors. Let's say that you, you want you know to have a, a pipe installed under the ground and you need to <coughs> excavate to get that pipe there. So you know ideally you want to excavate mm -hmm. that like this, because the minimum work that you need to do is you just open the hole for the diameter, drop your pipe, and move forward. But that's not normally the case because you need to have people going around that. So then you need some additional space on the sides to, to walk around, do some work, adjust the pipe, or whatever. Now, the, the thing becomes now a problem of the soil, right? If you have a, a wall like this, Right, and, and now the soil over here starts to get loose. There is a high possibility of this soil coming inside the trench and causing a, a failure and, and trap somebody down there. So that's why people then, uh, they cut the, the hole in this shape. So then they remove all this section of the uh, soil, right, and leave the pipe like that. So you have a slope here, and an angle, that supports the, the weight of the soil, so it right? So it doesn't collapse inside the trench. So now, what he was saying is that after you, you know, you put your, 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 your pipe over there and everything is set up, now you have to backfill the thing, right, and cover it. If the depth is uh, too high, then uh, let's suppose this is a 45 degree angle, now you have a huge area where you're making the <coughs> excavation. <coughs> so what people do is they, they, they open the, the, the trench and then they drop in uh, boxes, steel boxes, with cross supports that are going to hold the pressure of the side, the soil, the, the soil to prevent that from caving in inside the operator. We've seen pictures of that before. It's uh, those uh, steel boxes that are put inside. So that, that's another way of short. But w that steel box actually um, give enough space for the worker. Yep. And yeah, it does. And yeah. then it comes in three foot, six foot. Um, they have spreader bars that have attachments that you can, depending on what size pipe you are, right. you can spread it. Yeah, well remember that, that, that space that's is dictated by the contractor. Yeah. Because what happens is, is the more you open, the more work you have. We're gonna do later on to I, I give my guys a foot on each side of the pipe. Yeah, that's it. You get, you give them one on top. A foot. foot on each side of the pipe. Because the more you dig, the more money you're wasting. The more it costs, right? And the right. most time it takes, and then you have to backfill. Remember, after a certain day, when you're back lifting, let's say that you're doing work at the airport. Guess what? Now everything is compacted to a hundred percent. Yeah, every, yeah. Every, and every lift. Every, every yeah. six to eight inches. Yeah. It's, yeah. it's insane.
<laughs> and uh, that's a lot of money and time, right? Yeah, especially when you're, some, of your, some of your excavations are like 10 feet, 12 feet deep. That takes forever. Backfilling takes forever. So many times, and you're moving fast. So, so what you got to do there is you just got to have, you just got to have like multiple church right, boxes. Right. So you can have, you can still be working your crew while you have a background, you have a backfill crew working mm -hmm. on you. So technically, you're, when you're using that, then your, your, your box should be higher than the amount of spaces that you, than your, I guess. It doesn't have to be higher. It no. has to be within a, within a, a, so it doesn't a degree do of slope, right? You have to have your spill pile set back about four, at least, uh, I think it's four to six feet from the edge, depending on your spot, your, as much as the pile of dirt. You gotta have it, and then you gotta bank, you have to bank your, your, your spill. Is there, there's a certain way you can do it either sloping or you can bank it yeah. and create steps, 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 like if you were on a ladder. Uh, either way, benching. benching. Mm -hmm.